Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Evans with Urban Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to say hello and welcome to our Capital Connections series. Uh, this afternoon, we'll be having our grants and equities panel. Uh, should be another lively discussion where we try to get you the information you need with the ultimate goal of creating some success stories. Uh, we recognize that we have both for-profit and nonprofit individuals that may be interested in this topic. So we look forward to having you participate this afternoon. Uh, to get us kicked off, uh, what I wanna let you know is that if you have questions along the way, uh, please type them into the chat. Uh, we do have someone that will be monitoring the chat, plus I'll try to pay attention to it as well. And ultimately, although we have a set amount of questions and types of questions, we want to make sure that we cover the information that's important to you. In addition to that, I would encourage you to get the contact information for both sets of panelists so that you can follow up with them directly. So without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get started here. And what we'll do is I'll go in a round robin and allow each of the panelists to take about a minute to introduce themselves. And then we'll go ahead and start with our series of questions. And so why don't we do this? Uh, I'll kind of try to go in alphabetical order here. So we'll start with uh, Miles, if you would, maybe take a minute, introduce yourself, what agency you're with, and uh, very quickly how it may be germane to both for-profit or nonprofits, or if it's just with nonprofits, that's sufficient too. Go ahead, Miles. Well, thanks so much for having me, Ken, and to the Urban Chamber and Delisa. Thank you so much for all your efforts in organizing this panel. I'm excited to be here. My name is Miles Dixon. I'm the program director of Nevada Grant Lab, and we are a philanthropically funded initiative, um, really with a mission to address one of the biggest challenges that all of us know exists in Nevada and what we're talking about today, which is access to grants. And really specifically, our mission is to help uh, community organizations, particularly nonprofits, local governments, public agencies, and state agencies identify, tap, and best utilize historically underutilized federal funding, um, as well as other financial resources. And so we really do that through a combination of programs. Um, the way we spend most of our time is providing technical assistance in the form of a whole network of experts like grant writers, auditors, data researchers, analysts, that sort of thing, all of the technical skills that go into developing a great federal grant. Um, we provide technical assistance support to um, applicants. We really try to help organizations identify funding opportunities. Um, and then on the back end, uh, if and when organizations get awarded, we try to support post-award setup and administration best practices. So trainings around cash management and best practices in those areas. Um, the other part of work that we do is really focused on the policies and procedures, um, primarily at the state government level. Um, but I think over the next few years, we'll spend more and more time talking about it at a local level, which is as a state, we really haven't um, kept up pace, if you will, with uh, the innovations and changes in federal funding flows. Um, and so we really have, in many cases, policies, procedures, and practices throughout our governments here that really limit our ability to get our fair share. Um, and so uh, in that vein, I really quickly want to acknowledge Ken and the Urban Chamber for consistently being great advocates for this issue in Carson City and really across the board. And so Ken, for to you and your board and the team, thanks so much for your leadership on this issue. Um, over time, as we get Nevadans their fair share of federal funding, we know that'll of course create more businesses and a stronger economy, but what it'll also do is build stronger, more inclusive communities that uh, they really provide economic opportunity for all. So it's a pleasure to be here and thanks again so much for having me. Thank you very much, Miles. And absolutely, we're glad to be able to partner and support these efforts because to your point, uh, roughly the idea is for every dollar that we pay as tax Nevada taxpayers, we only get about 66 cents, 67 cents uh, back to the state. So we definitely wanna improve upon that. Uh, next up, I wanna go to uh, Aaron. And uh, if you would, Aaron, uh, please take about a minute or so and introduce yourself as well. Thank you and good afternoon. And I echo all of Miles' comments of, of thanks to you um, for having us and um, for all the work that you've done. I am Erin Hasty. I'm the interim administrator for the Office of Grant Procurement Coordination and Management or the Nevada Grant Office for short. 
Um, we are within the Nevada Department of Administration currently, um, but we have some exciting changes uh, coming up, which we'll probably talk about later. Um, and, and thanks to what Miles was talking about, the work that's gone on in Carson. Um, so I like to say that we have like a 30,000 foot view of grants. Um, we serve state agencies right now and, and um, help local governments and nonprofits with grant policy. Um, we really started out on the pre-award side. We helped uh, to write grant applications and bring in more grant dollars that way. We've now um, shifted our mission to reduce and remove um, grant any barriers to bringing in more federal dollars. And so um, I know a lot of you participated, but we've expanded again with the help of, of Miles and, and this group, um, having the Nevada Advisory Council on Federal Assistance and finding out more things that are prohibitive to having grant dollars in Nevada. So uh, we have an advisory council that we staff. Um, we'll have a grant match fund that um, will be up and running in the fall again, helping get grant match, dollar, grant match dollars to organizations who need that. And really just looking at um, what are barriers and how we can address those um, policy-wise. Excellent. And uh, one thing we appreciate always is the fact, to your point about helping out with uh, pre-grant assistance, technical assistance, I know we've availed ourselves of that and specifically uh, Delisa Stewart from my staff has, and we definitely appreciate that. Uh, next up, uh, we have a third panelist, and I'll keep going here. Uh, Janice, uh, we have a third panelist here, and if you would, Janice, please introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much again, as Miles and Aaron stated to the Urban Chamber and Ken and Delisa for inviting me to uh, be on today. Uh, again, my name is Janice Wiggins, and I am the founder of a company called Grant Me Success, and I provide grant writing services as well as consulting services for non primarily nonprofit organizations, but I also work with churches and small businesses to apply for grants um, at various levels. I know that Miles talked a lot about federal grants as well as Aaron. I also help organizations to apply for state grants, uh, local municipal grant grants through the county and city, as well as foundations and corporate grants. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what I do and I'm glad to be here. I've been here in Clark County for about 23 years. So certainly have been able to see us grow um, in many different areas in small business, as well as um, the need for social services that are primarily um, delivered through nonprofit organizations. So I've seen the nonprofit community grow here in Clark County as well. And how I got involved with grant writing is really um, my background is in social work. And so I've been a social worker here in the community for about 22 years and worked in various areas, uh, primarily in health, but also with the Department of Corrections, Medicaid, um, substance abuse treatment programs, uh, several other programs throughout the Valley. And I've been an employee who has been funded uh, by grant programs. And so I know how important it is to have that stability of you know, job security. And I wanted to know more about grants. And so I went to my supervisors and said, I want to help to write the grants. I wanna help with performance measures and understanding how is it that we can get more money or continue to receive grants. And then I became a federal grant reviewer and a subject matter expert for several federal organizations. And that's how I was able to get my experience uh, in writing grants. And I started my company about five years ago and just have been going ever since. And there certainly is no lead, no lack. There's certainly not a lack of need for grant writers in our community. And I really started um, providing services due to something that Miles mentioned, which is that I attended a workshop held at UNLV by the Brookings Institute. And that's where I learned about Nevada being what they call a donor state or a state that gives back to the federal government more money than we receive in federal funds. And I said, you know, I, I wanna do something about this. And so I started my company and uh, that's that. So glad to be here. Thank you so much. 
Excellent. And what I appreciate is that, uh, uh, Janice, I know you've worked with a few of our chamber nonprofits. So uh, I appreciate the fact that you're uh, one of the panelists uh, here this afternoon because you bring that perspective as well. Uh, in fact, uh, just a reminder, everyone, um, Ken Evans with the Urban Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you're participating in our Capital Connections series. Uh, today, we're going to have a session on grants, uh, followed by a brief break, and then we'll go into uh, equity investment. Uh, but again, uh, the idea behind this panel is to talk about grants. So let me first ask this question, and I think I want to lead this in with Miles. Uh, sometimes as small business owners, uh, we're wondering, is there a grant out there or a magical source of grants that we can tap into as a for-profit business? So maybe where I'd like to start and then we'll branch out from there is, from your perspective, are there grants for for-profit businesses or do we need to think and approach things a little bit differently? Miles. Well, thanks for that question, Ken. Let me maybe try to take that in two steps. One, offer a little context on what are federal grants, what and and not just federal grants. I think to Janice's point, you know, there's federal grants, there's state grants, there's municipal grants. Um, so much of the money really starts at the Fed and then it trickles down. So maybe I could offer a really quick context on what are grants, so that that way we can all have the same conversation and then get to so what grants are out there or how do private businesses access funding. Um, through grant programs. And I know Janice and Aaron will have, uh, have a lot to add too. So let me start with the grants thing. Uh, so we all talk about grants. All of us live in the grants world. Um, unlike Janice and Aaron, I am not a grants professional. My background is actually in public policy. Um, and so for me, the, the reason I got into this work is really similar to what Janice was saying, which was you know, 10 or 12 years ago when the Brookings Mountain West opened and Lindsay Institute opened at UNLV, um, the late Dr. Rob Lang talked a lot about the lack of flow of federal funding. And so that's really where I got interested in it. Um, and when we stand back and look at federal grants at a national level, um, it's actually a constitutional law issue. And so the feds raise money from all of us, right? Taxes, fees, all sorts of stuff. The federal government raises money and then redistributes that money every single year to the tune of almost $800 billion in domestic spending. And that domestic spending, what we think of as grants usually, is money that is intended to support the general welfare of this country. It's money that's intended to promote programs that are not specific to one state, right? So it's spending for the general welfare of the country and for stuff that no single one state can do, um, do itself. And so the, one of the first federal domestic spending programs was actually the National Guard, right? So the, the federal government raises money raises more money than any one state could do alone and provide services at a national level. I offer that to say that the reason that we have federal grants is that there is a general welfare purpose. So whether you think about building highways or creating a, um, a, a baseline for education or health services or economic development in all 50 states and the territories, that's the basis for federal grants. And so as a result, while we see federal grants touch almost every aspect of our community and our lives, one of the few places federal grants don't flow directly to, for the most part, are private businesses. Because both the federal government in the form of federal grants, as well as the IRS, right, when you form your corporation, you have to choose, am I for profit or am I tax exempt? And what entitles you to a tax exempt status is the ability to demonstrate that you are doing something for the general welfare of community, right? That the private sector doesn't do and that the government doesn't do. And so as a result, we see most federal funding flowing to state agencies, local governments, and other public agencies that serve the general good, the general welfare, or nonprofits that serve the general welfare in a way that government doesn't. So as a result, we don't see tons of money going directly to uh, private businesses because there's no public policy explanation for it. If you think about it, none of us probably wanna pay more taxes so we can provide grants to someone else's potentially competing business to us, right? Or a business that competes with us in a different jurisdiction. So from a policy standpoint, that's why we don't see them. Having said that, while we don't see a ton of flow directly to uh, small businesses, and there are some exceptions for things like innovation, research and development, um, farming, agriculture, especially in the Midwest and rural, we see a lot more federal money flowing directly to privately held businesses, but that's again for agriculture, which is a different public policy issue. Um, 
So we do see, though, uh, private businesses accessing federal grant dollars as vendors of grant recipients, for example. So think about the school district, right, or the state of Nevada. They get tons of federal money. Sometimes you, when you get a federal grant, you may hire another nonprofit or you may subgrant to a nonprofit to help deliver services. You may hire your own people internally, but in some cases, maybe IT, for example, right? Or another allowable use under a federal grant, you may be hiring private businesses to provide that aspect of a federal grant, but it's really is a subset of a larger grant. Um, so that would be the, the two things I would flag in terms of where we see federal grant dollars eventually flowing to private business is one, it may go direct to them in the case of research and development, innovation, that's NASA, Defense Department, energy, big innovation, or agriculture. Alternatively, we see them getting federal grants essentially as vendors of grant recipients like public governments or local governments, public agencies, and nonprofits. Excellent uh, description. And I wanted to make sure that you covered that because I do know that within our chamber membership and beyond, uh, we have both for-profit and nonprofit community-based organizations. And part of what we wanted to make sure we do as a part of our capital connections effort is they both need capital, whether they're a nonprofit or a for-profit, they both need capital, whether it's for-profit for to operate their business to produce a profit, or whether it's a nonprofit community-based organization that needs capital in order to provide their service uh, to the public good. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we covered that and we're not, if you will, saying no, there aren't grants out there. We just wanna make sure you take the appropriate pathway to those resources given your for-profit or nonprofit status. So let me transition to uh, Janice now. Uh, from you, I think you mentioned healthcare or being involved in healthcare. If you will, if I'm a small, let's take mental health service uh, provider, for example, and I may have a for profit company with a team of psychiatrists, for example. Uh, let's build on that. From your perspective, what types of grant opportunities might I want to pursue if I'm providing mental health care services? So in this instance, and, you know, with mental behavioral health, physical health, and probably many other industries, um, with the exception of the ones that Miles mentioned, they're probably all going to be treated similarly uh, when it comes to federal state grants or money that's passed down from the federal government to the state or local government. Um, it's important that when you are a for-profit organization that you understand one of the reasons why um, grant giving organizations typically give grant funds is because they can claim those funds as a tax deduction when an organization is a nonprofit, right? And so that's one of the reasons why you're less likely to see for-profit organizations receive grant funds because they don't have that 501c3 designation from the IRS that allows the grant giver to deduct that quote unquote donation or grant on their tax returns, right? It's not to say that, that there are no funds available for mental and behavioral health for-profit companies or any other type of for-profit business. They're just going to be a little bit more niche um, and you'll have to be more diligent about knowing where to look for those grants, how to find them, um, and probably getting some databases. So one particular database that's really good for federal grants is grants.gov. And I encourage whether um, an organization is a nonprofit business, a sole proprietorship, an LLC, or a nonprofit with a 501c3 designation or without a 501c3 designation to go on grants.gov, create an account on that site, and you can search for grant opportunities based on the type of organization you are. So it will, on the left-hand side of that grants.gov website, allow you to search for federal government grants by um, industry 
or the, the federal government agency that's giving a grant. And then also search by your designation, um, whether you're a for-profit business, a small business, sole proprietor, a church, a faith-based organization, or a nonprofit with a 501c3 or not. So that's kind of somewhere that you would want to start. Excellent. And then Aaron, you're with the Nevada Grants Office. So from your standpoint, in terms of uh, pre-grant assistance, uh, historically and maybe for the future, let's say that a nonprofit or in some cases is applicable or for-profit has done that research. They think they've identified a possible opportunity. How might your office help them to get started initially? Thank you for the question. Um, and that's a good one. Um, so we have shifted actually quite a bit. COVID required us to shift um, to start actually tracking COVID dollars. So unfortunately this past year, we've had to stop any kind of grant writing. Uh, we do uh, have a, a master service agreement where um, we offer for state agencies, they can use that for, for somebody who can write a grant. And I know the Nevada Grant Lab is uh, there for nonprofits, um, but we'll help identify uh, grants. Like I saw somebody just put in the comments that grants.gov can be really overwhelming and confusing. So we will help source uh, opportunities, we know how to kind of find them easily. And so we can help find um, an application. But you said if somebody's ready, I think the really important thing and what our office can especially help with right now is a lot of the grants that we're seeing are getting more and more competitive. And a lot of grants are also uh, now successful awardees are even regional um, partnerships. So we really strongly generally identif like ident recommend identifying partners that you're gonna go in with. And we can help um, if, if we know somebody's interested in that, we can reach out to our contacts and see if anybody else is planning on applying. Uh, we can help with uh, talking about like your project because another thing is, you know, grand tours, especially the feds like to see a really well thought out program. And so we can help you walk through your program and if we have staffing, we're happy to look through the application, the notice of funding opportunity and give, provide an outline for that. Like, here's what you need to answer. Here's how to fill it in. So um, just reach out to us where we can kind of, we'll make it how, how much staff we have and how much off assistance we can offer. One thing I'd like to add on to Miles' um, observations about federal grants and for businesses is I've seen a lot who, of state dollars and federal dollars who really are helping with workforce development and talent pipeline. And so that is a way that um, private businesses can get some dollars, but generally you have to partner with like a post-secondary education institution or a state agency. So we're happy to facilitate those if we have contacts, um, but that's what I've seen a lot of the big dollars going towards is, is talent pipeline development and, and skill, workforce skills. Okay, Aaron, so thank you very much. So what I heard you suggest, and I know we've availed ourselves to part of it is, you're willing to help an individual entity come up with an outline or a checklist that they can use to structure and put together their application. And I know that's been very helpful to us and I would encourage all our chamber members and others that may see this video to reach out to your office because if nothing else, that'll help you get your application organized. The other thing that I appreciate is you mentioning that uh, depending on what they're attempting to do, you'll maybe help someone with their effort to collaborate and identify other possible partners. Uh, and again, to your point, things are very competitive right now, so it helps to collaborate. Uh, for example, right now I'm aware of a uh, the U.S. Small Business Administration has a community navigator uh, grant application going on right now. And absolutely, uh, it will help. And they even identify in there, the more you collaborate, the better or higher probability of success. Miles, I want to come back to you uh, with this next question. For-profit or nonprofit, and I know you mainly deal with nonprofits, what are some of the things that a nonprofit should do in order to initially gather information or determine 
how good of a fit they are for a particular grant opportunity. Maybe one or two things you could share and then Janice and Janice, I'll wanna to go to you next with a similar question. So let me, I'll take a little different path, I think, than both Aaron and Janice may take as, as folks who work directly with organizations often and advise them on this. Here's what I would tell a board of directors or a CEO is understand the role of federal funding in solving the issue you work in, right? And so I think a big challenge we have in our community and more broadly our state is a real underappreciation for the importance of federal money, right? We talk about it in the sense that we're a donor state and we can look at the numbers and I, the Gwynn Center for Policy Priorities recently did a fantastic update of a study they did that found Nevada uh, is 54th in the country um, in terms of per capita federal investment. Um, what that means in dollars is from the national average, we're off $800 per person per year. That's just at the national average. And so the, the emphasis I would place for any leadership, uh, whether it's volunteer or within the organization, um, as well as elected leadership here in the state, is we have to stand back and understand the critical importance of federal funding in solving our most complex community issues here, especially in a state that frankly is really low um, revenue. Uh, there, there is no way I think, um, to build the sort of community, communities and economy that we want in this state if we do not really lean in on federal funding. Um, and so I offer that maybe even before the, hey, here's how to best find a federal grant, here's how to, here's how to build an application, here's the checklist, because I think there's something really fundamental happening here which is a misunderstanding of the importance of federal funding. And if we don't fix the, the, what feels like kind of inertia or cynicism around federal grants, I worry that we won't ultimately go far as a community. And so again, Ken, back to, back to credit, you know, kudos to you and the team and Aaron um, and, and really the governor and the treasurer for pushing hard and Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno for sponsoring legislation that is poised to fundamentally restructure the office that Aaron runs today and the state's approach to us. Because I think that while all the practical steps of here's what to do as an organization to get ready, here's how to find funding, here's great application tips and tools. If we don't as a community really get on track and focused about this, we're gonna continue to live in the one-off space. Um, and so for us, that's really why our mission is about fundamentally bending the curve around our, our decades long underperformance in federal funding because of what it means for our state is somewhere between a half a billion and a billion dollars per year of new revenue that will fund the very sorts of community investments that will help our businesses grow, that will support your members both in their professional life, their economic life, but also in their, in their private life and their family life. So I think that would be my call to action for everybody is start with a commitment to really understand federal funding and lean in Everything after that is a process and amazing people like Janice and Aaron and others through Grant Lab are here to support that work. But we have to start with a commitment to fix this problem. Very much agree. And that's the reason why as a chamber, we supported the bill and legislation uh, to beef up the presence of the uh, grants, Nevada Grants Office, as well as make sure that it was resourced uh, accordingly. Uh, Janice, I want to come to you next, maybe to dive a little bit more into some of the practical things, not everything, but I want you to cover at least maybe a couple of key highlights. And while you're doing that, I would ask both Aaron and Miles to put their information into the chat because there's a, there are a couple of individuals that if you could share your contact information, they may want to follow up with you. But Janice, if you will, maybe one or two highlights of things that a entity should consider doing in order to get started with the process? Sure, so there's really a lot um, that organizations can do, whether you're for-profit or nonprofit, can do to best position um, your organization to be able to receive a grant. And this is really where I start with most of my clients because it's, you know, we don't want to just jump right in and, and start applying for stuff if you don't even, as Miles said, understand the broader context of why this grant is available, because we don't want to do things that are one off, meaning that you get the grant this year and then next year you're not eligible or you, you know, the grant is going away, you didn't understand that this was temporary funding. 
um, that it's not a long term solution to the problem that you're trying to solve or address. Um, so I really go through a process where I talk to clients about um, what is really the mission and vision of the organization, first and foremost, what is the problem that they're wanting to address and what is the solution that they're proposing. And in that solution, what are some goals and objectives? What are activities? And of course, we can redefine, we can define all of those things at a later time in the grant application process. But those are things that I want people to be thinking about first and foremost, because you don't just get a grant, you have to do something <laughs> to be eligible to receive the grant. Um, and those activities, there are going to be people, eyeballs, that are going to be looking at the product, program, or service that you offer or deliver, and they're going to make some evaluation about whether or not you're doing that well to decide if you're going to be eligible to continue to receive those free dollars, right? Everybody wants a grant because it's quote unquote free. And we like free. I like free. I like discounts and I like free, right? Um, so, but for organizations, I would say really start with your essential documents. Uh, in the world of social work, for me, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So in the grant world, if you don't have documentation, you don't exist. Right. And why would I give money to an organization that doesn't exist? So if you're for profit, it's important that you are a for profit that's documented, meaning you have an EIN number. You are registered with the secretary of state in your state that you have a DUNS number, D-U-N-S, a DUNS number. You have a SAM registration, S-A-M dot gov registration. Um, those are some things that even before you apply for a grant, whether you're for profit or nonprofit, that you need to have those things in place before you even start applying. You need to make sure you have a business bank account, right? Um, because the money is not going to come to your personal checking or savings. So all of those things need to be set up first as a foundation before you even start looking. And then the next thing is to think about those things that I talked about previously, which are the activities, products, program, goals and objectives, activities, and why this is important and what problem you are solving um, by receiving these grant funds. Excellent answer, uh, because what you've laid out is two key things. First of all, the entity, whether it's a for-profit or a nonprofit, must be structured and have documentation of that structure so that someone will be comfortable granting funds to them. And then the second thing that you pointed to is doing some upfront research analysis, self-reflection, if you will, to see, are they a good fit? Meaning, do they provide a product or a service that will meet a need and not just meet it, as you mentioned, one-off, but for an ongoing basis. Uh, so great response. Uh, we are getting some uh, questions both in Facebook as well as chat, and we'll make our way into it. Uh, what I wanted to come back to is, Janice, you responded, uh, maybe say verbally uh, for everyone's benefit, uh, you mentioned something about there being filters. So maybe take a minute or so and talk about how they can use filters or some of the other uh, characteristics at grants.gov to hone in on what they should really consider applying for. Sure. So we know that the federal government is a massive entity, right? Um, it is huge. So if I am a health related business and I get on grants.gov or I am involved in education, whether for profit or nonprofit, doesn't matter because this website is for both, grants.gov is for both, or a faith based organization, a church. Um, if I get on that website, I can really truly get lost in just searching. You can search forever, just like you can Google forever. You can be on YouTube forever, right? And looking for what you're trying to find. But there are filters on the grants.gov website. And what I mean by that is they allow you to do keyword searches. They allow you to search by government agency. And what I mean by that is the Department of 
whatever your industry is, right? So Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Education, Department of Transportation, whatever your industry is, you can search for grants and filter out that I only want to search in Department of Education uh, divisions for grant opportunities. Uh, and then I can say, and I'm a small business, so I only want to find grants within the Department of Education uh, for which small businesses are eligible to apply. Uh, and then you can search for um, deadlines, you know, when is it due, because that's really important in the grant world. You cannot apply for a grant late and think that you're going to receive funding. You won't. <laughs> All right. So um, it's, in, it's important to just start there, go on that website, take a look. And although it's massive, that's why you have organizations like Nevada Grant Lab, you have organizations like the Nevada Office of Grants and Procurement to reach out to. There's for-profit entities such as myself, Grant Me Success. There are your local libraries. There are a lot of resources that you will have to take the initiative in and your organization will have to take the initiative to reach out and say, hey, help me with this. There's the Urban Chamber. There's the Small Business Administration. They are here for small businesses. So I would just encourage organizations to, to leverage those type of um, entities for help. And YouTube really truly is a great help also. Um, perfect, so. perfect. And Aaron, I wanna move on to you uh, because uh, Janice introduced the subject. Uh, one of the questions was if an individual uh, is a veteran owned uh, business, what they wanted to find out is uh, twofold. Uh, part of the question is, are there grants for disabled veterans? And then are there also grant opportunities specific to a, a certain ethnic demographic, like for example, black businesses? So from your perspective, part A, if I'm a disabled veteran or looking for grants for disabled veterans, and then part B is maybe if I have an ethnically based business, is there a way that your office can make them aware of possible grant opportunities? Thank you for that. And, and thank you to Miles and Janice's great advice um, on that. Before I get to the question, I just wanted to point out one other thing that might help um, if people are looking for grants. A great way that I found is signing up for federal agency listservs. Um, they'll send out a lot of times newsletters um, for example, like the Small Business Administration will send out pretty regularly um, information that they're doing or this uh, SAMHSA um, with, with health will send out uh, newsletters of what they're doing, um, grant opportunities, and then they'll send out also what they funded. And so that can be a really um, nice wealth of information. So I recommend that if you find an in area you're interested, find federal agencies and, and sign up for that. And then just real quick, and then I'll get back to the question too is um, we have a centralized web page on our office. It's grants.nv.gov. And we try and put together all of the state uh, agencies, their individual grant management units. So if you're interested in that, I, I would also recommend looking at the state agencies that you're that are in your alley. So like if it's health, you know, signing up for the health um, listserv from the grants management unit at DHHS and they'll send out opportunities as well. So I just wanted to plug that. Um, so for individual disabled veterans, I would say that my office doesn't see grants that go to individuals. It's generally for like organizations or like what Janice was talking about um, earlier, trying to solve like a, a problem or community problem. And so we don't see grants for individuals what we would refer them to like Nevada 211 to find resources that way. Um, if they have um, like a, a specific business, I have seen grants like that. Um, and I was just on the phone today with the Small Business Administration and they have part of their um, idle loans. They will forgive some of that up to $10,000 if you um, live in a certain zip code um, you have to put in your address, but if you're in a um, economically impacted community, they'll forgive that. So there definitely are 
um, kind of specialty grants and that's what they seem to be interested in funding is helping those who haven't necessarily been served get service. Um, there was also, um, I lost my train of thought, <laughs> there was veterans. They will help veterans businesses. The Small Business Administration has veterans, it's boots to business, I believe is what it's called. And that's available on their website to sba.gov. And then the uh, Small Business Development Centers, you can go to them and they'll help with that. Um, and the, it's nevadasbdc.org. I can put that in the chat too. They'll help um, walk through all the SBA opportunities that do focus on veterans and, and any other specialties. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, and that's the thing is we're trying to plant some seeds uh, as part of Capital Connections, for-profit, non-profit, uh, plant some seeds and help individuals uh, figure out how to do more efficient research. And Miles, I think you had some additional ideas for how to help our audience more efficiently identify possible opportunities. So go ahead, Miles. Yeah, um, so I, I wanted to build a little bit on the on the conversation around are there grants that go either directly or is there a way that, you know, whether it's a veteran owned business or a minority owned business or women owned business. Um, so again, we don't see a lot of funding go directly to private businesses um, and we don't see it go simply because you have a private business or simply because you are a veteran owned business. Similarly, we don't see grants go to nonprofits just because they're nonprofits, right? Just because it's a food pantry. Grants really are premised on the idea of um, some sort of unique offering you're doing that meets a community need, right? And so when we think about the flow of money, um, it, it's really tricky if you're a business and it's a coffee shop, right? Whereas if you're a business and you have this, the one unique idea to, for new fuel for NASA, right? It, there's a matter of uniqueness of the work um, is usually where we see it. I, I wanna take the conversation a little downstream though in terms of if I'm a veteran owned business or a historically disadvantaged business or, or anything um, in that kind of category where you do see a lot of opportunity is as a vendor to grant recipients. This is different, I would note, than um, what does it look like for me to get a grant? This is what is it like for me to get a contract to be a vendor and set aside the fact that, you know, whether it's the city of Las Vegas or Three Square that's paying you via grant funds or philanthropic funds or property taxes, right? Um, most of our local governments and our state agency, I know for a fact in state agency, we see additional points, if you will in the scoring of procurement for Nevada-based businesses, for historically disadvantaged businesses. We see numerous um, preferential, we see um, the goal of, I should say, we all know unfortunately does not work out as consistently or as uniformly as it should, but we see from a policy standpoint at the Fed, um, the federal level, a desire to get money to um, downstream businesses that are owned by certain communities, certain individuals, certain et cetera, right? Um, but that really happens at the secondary procurement stage. So I'm the Clark County School District. I've gotten a $20 million grant to invest in technology innovation, and I need to find vendors who are going to help build that. That's where you're going to see higher opportunity and additional points in the hiring and the, the procurement process. So I just want to flag, I think that's a really important thing. And so what are you going to do about it? Go and talk to one, register, um, much to their credit, most local governments and state agencies have all entered into um, a single uh, procurement system. I think it's called NGEM, if I Correct. remember. Correct. You know this stuff better than I do. Uh, so is, register with NGEM to Janice's point. If you don't have a business license, you're not registering, which means if you don't register, you can't see what's available and you sure can't bid on it. So make sure that you have all of those documents in order but really register on the contract and procurement side of this because you will see a lot more effort and prioritization to get those dollars into the hands of small businesses that are led and owned by um, people of color, women, veterans, disabled, et cetera. And, and, and the point you're making is that ultimately, instead of focusing on trying to get the direct grant where we want our, the majority of our audience to focus on is being vendors, suppliers to either the public agency or the major private prime that may in 
some cases still be doing something for a major public agency. And Janice, I think you wanted to add something as well. Uh, great conversation here. And Janice, I'm gonna focus your response in that someone asked, for example, what if job development, like we had a 33% unemployment rate in the state of Nevada. So what if a for-profit or it could be a nonprofit has job development as a component to the service that they're providing, how might they incorporate that into a possible grant opportunity? Go ahead, Janice. I'm gonna lead them right back to Miles's comments and your comments. So I think it's important for small business to understand the pool that they're swimming in, right? We're, we're, we're wanting to get small businesses and nonprofits to understand Am I swimming in this pool or am I swimming in that pool, right? Um, the pool that small businesses are swimming in are the vendor pool, the contract pool, and the supplier pool. So I'm not saying don't be focused and don't think that your small business can get a grant. But as a small business, you are more likely to be successful in becoming a vendor, a supplier, or a contractor with a government organization that has access to grant funds. It's just about how you're accessing that money. It's less likely through grants and more likely through contracts. As a nonprofit, that pool is, they are more likely to access grant funds through directly by applying for a grant, not necessarily as a contractor, vendor, or supplier, okay? So it's just about becoming more familiar with terminology. Everybody wants a grant because they feel like, oh, it's free money, cash up front, I'm going to get $10,000 or $100,000 or the magic number that a lot of my clients want is a million dollars, right? Austin Powers. <laughs> um, but understand that grants oftentimes are reimbursement base, even for nonprofit organizations. And here's what that means. It means I have to provide the service up front out of pocket. And then I turn in a document that shows that I've provided the service. And here's how much money my organization has put up front. And then the government reimburses me 30 days, 60 days later. Okay. So all the, although the money is quote unquote free with a grant, you still have to start out with some type of capital or some type of money because you don't get the check up front always. You have to provide the service product or, um, you know, you have to do something first and then you're reimbursed on the back end. So it's the same with a contract being a vendor or supplier. So that person who is looking to be a work force developer or work in job development, it's the same idea. I would encourage that person to connect with organizations such as um, Workforce Connections, right? Um, there are some other, I'm, I can't think of all who they are. Even the state of Nevada, um, DEETER, the Department of Employment, Training and Rehabilitation, contact the vocational rehab division of that organization and let them know about your business and find out how do you become a supplier or a vendor or contractor of job development with that entity. You will have to provide the service and they will pay you for the service that you provide. Excellent. And what I really appreciate, Janice, that you just did is you took us through if you're a for-profit, you may be able to be a grant sub-recipient. At the same time, if you're a for-profit entity, I'm sorry, if you're a nonprofit, you can be a sub-recipient, grant sub-recipient. If you're a for-profit, perhaps you can be a contracted supplier or vendor. So excellent. This is what we wanted to come out of today's Capital Connection, is helping everybody better understand the pathway to getting 
access to the capital, whether they're a for-profit or a non-profit in the grants world. Uh, again, what I'd like to ask all our panelists to do is, once again, if you could put your contact information into the chat room, uh, because we may have had some other people join us since we started. Plus, in addition to that, uh, we'll make an effort to post uh, contact information, uh, especially to the people that signed up and registered, and we'll figure out a way to also get the information out. We know we have a Facebook Live and people are joining us there. Uh, we've got about nine minutes left before we take about a 10 minute transition break. So in the time we have left, uh, there's maybe a couple of key items I'd like us to cover. And then I'm also trying to go uh, to the chat here. So very quickly, uh, one of the chat questions was, uh, they have a small business and then within their small business, they have a program. So the program is not necessarily a formed separate nonprofit, but they think the program may be something that could be eligible to qualify for a government or state grant. So maybe Miles, what I'd ask you is, and, and I think I somewhat know the answer from what we've talked about, is would they be able to be a supplier perhaps to a jurisdiction? Yeah, it, it, so every jurisdiction has its own kind of uh, procurement process and contract process. Um, they all share the baseline, which is Nevada revised statute that guides this sort of stuff. But each one has a, its own little process it goes through. Yes, uh, you know, I can tell you there really is a sense of priority and urgency within the public agencies and leaders I talk to, to really diversify um, the, the contract pool, they recognize small business is so critical and vital to our economy and, uh, and job growth. And so, yeah, I think that there's a real priority there. Um, I do think much like everything else in business, right, whether you're in a nonprofit or a for-profit characterization, uh, we have to be competitive. We have to sometimes really figure it out, right? So um, the best way from a government standpoint Make sure you're registering in NGEM or any of the other contract systems. Like I said, most local governments share a single contracting system. The state has its own. Um, make sure you register. You build a profile. It will let you designate, I'm in consulting, or I do medical, or I do uh, groundskeeping, whatever the business is. You can tell people what your services are. The system will automatically notify you of new grant op or pardon me contract opportunities. Um, and I really think to take Janice's lead, the right way to look at it is: Am I a for-profit or, or am I a non-profit? I.e., with the IRS, have I got a tax-exempt designation? If I have a tax-exempt designation, then grants, for the most part, are probably going to be the pathway I walk down. That's the pool I'm going to get in. If I am a for-profit company. I am most likely looking at being a vendor, a contractor, or a supplier, or something in that space that provides services to a government. And I would just tell you, if you're going into that pool, don't worry where they get their money from until you get the contract. Then you worry about, oh, it's grant, which means it's a little bit more temporary. But I can tell you, most grants are at least a year. Most government contracts are at least a year. I wouldn't worry about it much. Focus on, on finding the opportunities to become a vendor, a contractor, or a supplier to local governments. And don't overlook our big nonprofits in this region. You know, we have really, really large nonprofits. They employ, I think, 58,000 people um, in the region. So they, don't overlook them. Uh, make sure you're, you're reaching out to your nonprofits and talking to them about what they're doing to find vendors and contract. Excellent. And with that, I want to come to Aaron. I think you had a few. Uh, things you'd like to add to the conversation here as well. Yeah, just real briefly, along with that, um, I, the Nevada Governor's Office of Economic Development, they have a Procurement uh, Technical Assistance Center. I'll put that information in the chat as well, but they will help walk through uh, your business and talk to you and try and get you on like the government uh, procurement pro uh, system. So I will put that in there. That is available and they'll sit with you one-on-one -on -one and help with that. Absolutely. Uh, it's a uh, PTAC and uh, absolutely uh, from today, I, I have to admit as uh, much as I'm involved with PTAC and other entities, 
definitely y'all have sharpened up my skills as far as searching for grant opportunities in the appropriate manner is the adjective that I will use. Uh, well, with that, uh, we have about uh, four minutes left. So what I always like to do in situations like this, I wanna give each of our panelists one minute to kind of leave something with the audience and then we'll conclude from there. So I'm gonna go in reverse order this time, uh, reverse alphabetical order. So Janice, uh, 60 seconds, something you'd like to leave with our audience here today. Okay, so I'm gonna take this opportunity to do a plug. I am actually offering a grant writing basics class, which um, some people here on this, on this uh, webinar might benefit from. They can go to my website, www.grantmesuccess.com. I'm offering that this Friday at 11 a.m. So that is an opportunity for us to be in a smaller environment, for you to engage with me one-on-one, -on -one, for you to tell me specifically about what your business is, and I can help to provide you a little bit more guidance and direction. And then outside of that, of course, you can email me and we can get on a call together and I can help to guide you. I want to leave people with Myself, Miles, Aaron, we're not saying that there are absolutely no grants out there for small businesses. My small business was able to get some COVID related grants. Okay. Um, there are other grants that I, as a small business, am applying for. But that's because I've gone through a process to search specifically within my industry and find out what's available for my industry. And so if you are a janitorial business, if you are a health related business, if you are education, you offer tutoring services, if you, you offer accounting services, you just have to begin to narrow down and like I said, niche down to find out where are you going to find those specific grant opportunities that's applicable to your business type. And, um, you know, we've given you lots of resources here about how you can be able to do that. Feel free to email me and reach out and I can email you some of that information as a recap. Perfect. Thank you very much, Janice. Uh, Aaron, if you will, uh, 60 seconds, closing thoughts to our audience. Okay. Well, thanks again for having us and for the conversation. Um, I think I learned a lot and I'm, I'm, I, I'm really pleased with what everybody said. Um, so thank you. So to add on to that is hard <laughs> to top what's been said. Um, for me, what I think to take away from grants, what I tell people is grants are a lot of work. Um, and to Denise's point, we're not saying that there aren't any available, but writing the grant is a lot of work and then getting it is probably even bigger. And so you really need to be structured to and be prepared if you do get a grant that you have the resources to oversee it, to make your deliverables and to make sure like Janice said prior as well, that you're, you're meeting the program goals. Um, so this program and there's fiscal. So make sure that you can do it because it's not, you get it and then you're good. Like there is quite a bit of reporting and, and work that needs to be done. I would also recommend that you should, and I'm sure that you already are, but really get to know if you're finding grants in your area and you're not eligible as a for-profit business, look and see who is. And it might be like a state agency or somebody um, like a nonprofits. So get to know those people and let them know what you're doing uh, and let them know your, your mission, your project goals, what you hope to accomplish. And so when a grant comes and they need partners, they can think of you to go to that. And so really get yourself out there uh, because grants are getting more competitive, like we've talked about, and especially for the Department of Labor, there are employers who are needed on those. So get to know agencies who are eligible and let them know what you're doing. So then when a grant opportunity comes up, they think of you um, as a way to help them make their comp application competitive and meet their program deliverables. Excellent. Thank you, Erin. Uh, last but not least, uh, Miles, 60 seconds to close this out. Thanks, Ken. Well, I'm going to go a slightly different direction because Aaron and Janice have given you great advice on what you can do as an organization. Um, let me say that I think that we often talk about grants as a revenue to our organizations, right? Whether it's a for-profit or a non-profit. Let me also just share uh, an observation, which is many of us in, in private business know that revenue is one part of success. Another part of success is finding talent. 
Another part of success is thinking about the challenges that our employees and our team members face every day, whether it's in childcare or access to affordable housing or high quality education. And in all of those issues, federal grants are critical. We will not find as a community and no community finds success in building a high quality education system, a workforce pipeline, affordable housing or community assets like after school centers and child care centers without really maximizing the importance and the role of federal grants. So one of the things that I think while it's not direct revenue to your organization, and I know that's what we all think about often every day, we wake up, uh, we wake up and go to bed thinking about how am I gonna pay the bills? But I just would impress on you the opportunity to talk to your elected officials, your stakeholders, your community leaders about in this state, finally getting really serious and really focused on fixing this state and our community's historic underperformance in federal funding. Because if we don't build a talent pipeline and community assets like child care centers and a high quality education system, all of which will largely be funded by federal funds, not just emergency COVID and American Rescue Plan dollars, but every single day, federal grant dollars, we will always struggle as a local economy. So uh, please take the time not only to find your own grant opportunities, but really talk to your elected officials and your policymakers and your community leaders about what we can do together to continue to push for progress so that Nevadans can get their fair share of federal funding. Excellent. And that's a great uh, universal comprehensive message to close us out on. Again, I'm Ken Evans with the Urban Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you've been watching our Capital Connections grants panel. Uh, what we're going to do now is we are going to take about a eight minute break here and then we will convene our equity investor panel and that will be our next panel that we do as a part of capital connections i want to say thanks again to aaron janice and miles for being with us today for today's grants panel uh, again we're recording this plus in addition it's facebook live and we will see you back here in about eight minutes Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And we'll keep the, for those that are following on Facebook Live, we'll keep the link up as well as we'll uh, continue to record. What we'd encourage you to do is to take a break uh, if you need to check email or whatever, and then we'll be bringing our next set of panelists in to get started uh, shortly right. here. Hey, good afternoon again. This is uh, Ken Evans with the Urban Chamber of Commerce. I want to say welcome back to our Capital Connections. Uh, this time we'll be talking about uh, equity investment. Uh, we have another really great uh, panel this afternoon. I want to say thanks again to Aaron, Janice, and Miles for being part of our grants panel. Again, what we're doing is we are Facebook live streaming this. In addition, we are recording it so we can make it available. Well, as I mentioned, uh, we're about to go into an equity investment panel. I'm sure we have for-profit members out there that are wondering whether I'm a small business that's trying to get started and launch, or whether I'm a larger business that's trying to grow or scale. How do I access capital in terms of getting equity investors to participate and invest in my business? And I think we have a great group of panelists uh, to answer that question, as well as others you may have. Uh, before we get started administratively, as we make our way through this, if you have questions, please type them into the chat. In addition to that, for those of you that are following on Facebook Live, we're also trying to monitor questions or comments there as well. Uh, what I first want to do is start out by having each of the panelists uh, introduce themselves. And similar to what I did before, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. So I want to start out, uh, just have each of them uh, tell us about a minute or so about themselves and from an equity investment standpoint, uh, how they got into this arena. And we'll start with my colleague, 
Uh, always appreciate working with him and collaborating with him. We'll start with my colleague from the Latin Chamber, but I think today he's representing a different entity, so he'll introduce that to us. Uh, Peter Guzman, if you will, please introduce yourself. Yes, uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, always a pleasure working with you all as, as well, and thank you for the invitation to, uh, to be able to speak a little bit today. Um, my name is Peter Guzman. I am president of the Latin Chamber of Commerce, and under that umbrella, we have a partnership with the Urban Chamber of Commerce uh, called VCAUS, uh, where me and Ken um, try to help small businesses, quite frankly, um, and we've been doing it a long time. Um, basically, it's called VCAUS, Valley Center Opportunity Zone, uh, which is a grant giving program. Uh, you have to meet certain criteria, but we've, uh, uh, both myself and Ken have always tried to narrow it down to, you know, as much as we could, especially from where it began, where it was a, uh, in a lot of ways more difficult than going into a bank to get a grant. Uh, you know, listen, these dollars are available. This is what I've always told the state and all the legislators. If there's dollars available, let's give it out. If there's not, then let's don't. Uh, but let's certainly not make it impossible to get some of these dollars. And with that, uh, the Latin Chamber and Urban Chamber in that partnership with Because has been able to, to give out over a million, a million six in grants, uh, helped a lot of people, kept businesses open. Uh, I mean, as, uh, you know, as far back as I can remember when we had, you know, serious uh, uh, things going on in the community uh, and in our country, quite frankly, uh, we were able to help uh, businesses stay afloat through small grant dollars. And we can prove that uh, we can prove the power of these small grants um, many times over. Uh, we, have, uh, we have example after example of people who constantly say that these grant dollars help them survive, help them stay open, pay their rent. You can use these dollars to pay your lease, buy some software that'll help you uh, automize, automize and, and a lot of other things. So uh, very proud of that, uh, that, that grant program. Uh, also proud to say that, you know, this is an arena that I think I, I can say, speak for my colleague as well. We're very passionate about uh, both Ken and myself and understand the power of capital, the power of an infusion of cash. Uh, we can train, which is important. We can train all day long. We can uh, webinar all day long. But at the end of the day, um, small businesses need access to capital and so we also did a thing called Tri Chamber Pro the Tri Chamber Grant Program that was wildly successful. And uh, I know that we're hoping for some more funds here that the county has uh, because we have a proven track record. And I testified recently on behalf of us uh, to let them, to remind them that, you know, we have a track record. Our Tri, our tri Chamber Program uh, went very smoothly and every dollar can be accounted for. And, um, you know, I want us to do it again. I want us to help those small businesses that are out there. So uh, I might have taken a little much, too much time. I apologize for that in advance, but I'm very passionate about this subject. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Peter, for that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we'll also have him pick up on, I think he has an investment company, OPA, that he'll come circle back to as well. Uh, what I next want to do is have... Uh, Chris, introduce himself and maybe just briefly touch on how you interact with individuals that are interested in equity investment. Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Ken, for, for the invitation. Excited to be here uh, presenting to the Urban Chamber of Commerce. Um, very supportive of what, of what you guys do. Peter, same, same to you and your organization. Um, I'm a partner in a corporate group at a law firm called Holland & Hart. Um, we're a Mountain West law firm, about 450 attorneys. Uh, and about 500 dedicated staff members, um, all, of, all of us committed to, ser to servicing our clients here in the Mountain West. Um, my practice focuses primarily on three areas. Uh, one is venture capital, um, emerging growth. And so that's rate helping companies, startups raise money, um, you know, all the way from Silicon Valley companies to folks want to open a dry cleaner here in the Valley, um, all, all over the map as far as what I do on that front. Um, another part of my practice is I form venture capital and private equity funds for fund sponsors. Um, so basically the, the opposite side of the coin, um, these are folks that are 
raising money, but I, I'll, I'll be honest, um, venture funds in particular are very much like a startup. Um, oftentimes they're headed up by folks that have had a liquidity event or they've worked at a very large money manager and are excited to kind of, you know, get, get outside the box a bit and, and start making, you know, uh, impactful investments in an, in an area they think is underserved. Um, the, the last part of my practice is I represent institutional investors, whether it be those same venture capital or private equity funds, um, governmental agencies, um, family offices in making um, investments. And those investments are either into venture capital, private equity hedge funds, or co-investments directly into companies. Um, but yeah, we've been, been, been a part, we've been with Holland and Hart for six years, um, been licensed to practice law since 2012. Um, so, you know, been here in Nevada since about that time, and it's been um, a pleasure to serve the Nevada community and looking forward to the panel today. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, I already know we're going to have some uh, good questions and discussions. Uh, last but not least, I uh, want to introduce, have Ryan introduce himself. Uh, just share with us a little bit about yourself, your background, and again, germane to the panel today, uh, how you're involved in the equity investment arena. Ryan, if you would, please introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Again, uh, thanks to you for having me on the panel. Uh, excited to meet everybody and participate. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the acting director of economic and urban development for the city of Las Vegas. Uh, prior to that, I was in the governor's office of economic development uh, when uh, Brian Sandoval was in office. Prior to that, I worked for Station Casinos for a while in analytics, and I'm originally from Michigan. I wound up um, supporting entrepreneurs and startups. Um, really, when I came to the city, we had uh, some governmental programs within GoEd uh, that made investments into uh, businesses, whether that be startups or scaling businesses. Uh, we had different programs, but my main focus was attracting big, biz big business. When I came to the city, um, we didn't have a lot of the I would say industrial assets. And I really switched over to small business, entrepreneurs, uh, technology, innovation, building ecosystems. And that's when I started uh, kind of diving into some of the challenges that Las Vegas, is, Las Vegas has faced over the, over the years and in, in uh, getting new startups and scale up companies. Um, and so that, that kind of landed me here in this conversation. Excellent, this is gonna be a great conversation, I can already tell. Uh, I wanted to also come back to P Peter briefly because uh, he's part of a OPA group. And I know we have the VCAS uh, topic, but uh, germane to this panel, I also wanted you to touch on OPA group and how it's involved with equity investment real quick before we dive into further discussion. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll, we'll tackle that. Uh, I, I might've misunderstood you and wanted you to, didn't know if you wanted me to bring up VCOS or not, but this might not be the arena for that. You're right, um, in retrospect. The OPA group is something that, uh, uh, man, I started 21 years ago. Uh, my background is real estate. Uh, so I started out as, you know, like, like many others, just doing residential real estate, which grew into commercial real estate, which grew into residential commercial real estate, which grew into developing uh, over, I think, uh, a couple hundred thousand square feet of... Uh, of uh, office warehouse space that I developed over off of Sunset and Boulder Highway area, tucked away there. And so I started learning about investments more. And, uh, and from all of that, yeah, OPA Group uh, uh, kind of developed, like I said, 20, over 21 years ago. And uh, so we, we invest. I mean, we'll, we you know, I have access to dollars of investors that, that trust me uh, because of a track record. And so, you know, uh, the ability to look at projects and make decisions and then ask for investment dollars uh, is real. Uh, it exists and there's a market for it. Um, some are easier than others. Let's face it, nothing's really easy and it's not supposed to be. Uh, but um, we've, made, we've made good investments 
And uh, I think that uh, uh, it's, it's definitely something to, to add in your list of uh, areas to try to find capital if you're looking for an investment dollar. Excellent. And so to kind of kick things off, I think I want to start with Chris here. Uh, sometimes people think, whether it's a venture capitalist or it's an angel investor, the thought is, well, they're going to take my company or they're going to take me over or they're going to be too much in my business. So, Chris, what I want to start the question with is, from your perspective, what is an equity investor and what is their mindset to kind of start the conversation off? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a very good question. And so, you know, when I look at this, the landscape of who is an equity investor, it can be anywhere from your friends and family, your parents, your siblings, um, all the way up to a pension fund, um, you know, Bay Area based venture fund. It truly is a very wide gamut of, of potential investors out there. The, the most important thing for a founder or a person that is running a business is to really take a step back and say, do I need an equity investor or do I just need cash? Because there are all, there are all different ways to get cash to help scale a business. There's SBA loans. You can work with the Nevada um, Small Business Development Center. Um, there's, a, there's a conglomerate of federal and state agencies there that are looking to help entrepreneurs. And then for folks that say, you know what, I really do want equity investors. I want to grow and scale my business and add employees. And I think I need to have investors to do that. Folks really need to understand that once you take in an outside investor and they own part of your company, you have a duty to the company and to its stockholders uh, or members, whatever type of entity it is. You have a duty to the owners to, to be a good steward of that business. And what that may mean over time, um, depending on how much of a business a person gives up, when I hear the founder say, hey, I took on equity and I got kicked out. Sometimes what that happens is, is investors will negotiate certain control mechanics um, to make sure that the business stays on a growth pattern. And if part of those control mechanics are, you know what, if we decide that the CEO isn't the right fit anymore, then the CEO isn't the right fit anymore and the stockholders or the members or whoever has voting control can vote out that person and terminate that person. And a lot of founders will get you know, frustrated when that happens. Um, a, a really big public one recently um, was WeWork. Um, you, you saw the, the CEO of WeWork kind of, kind of exit um, over time. Um, but it's one of those situations where you know, companies pivot, they you know, have disagreements with management. And so when you take, out, when you take on equity investors, you need to understand that you know, potentially losing control is, is, a, is a real thing, but it's a, it's a trade, right? Because that person is coming in and you're getting to actualize value in your company, not having to wait around for a sale. And, and if founders are genuinely concerned, they really should negotiate things like employment agreements, um, maybe change, you know, accelerated vesting uh, upon terminations for things other than for cause. There, there's all things founders can do to, to protect themselves um, in a situation where if it, if it doesn't work out with an equity investor. There's also things that I tell people of, hey, you know, if you're selling off a large enough chunk of your company to a private equity firm or a venture firm and they're going to take operational control, maybe make sure you negotiate in your deal taking some money off the table and so that you can kind of get cashed out in that moment, actualize that value individually. They're going to want to put a significant amount of money in the company, but then also negotiate additional equity grants through an equity incentive plan um, and really get sort of more equity over time um, versus having to continue to buy it or put your own money into the company. But it's definitely something that, you know, it's an exciting moment for an entrepreneur, but they need to make really certain that they're partnering up with the right type of equity investor if they want an equity investor at all. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, for uh, providing that uh, context and that perspective. Uh, because again, I think there's a fear on the part of some small business owners or even large ones about being quote unquote kicked out or edged out. But to your point, the good thing about it is there's the ability to structure things up front, have discussions up front to protect yourself as well as to make sure that you're adequately compensated along the journey. Uh, Ryan, what I'd like to next do is 
come to you. You mentioned the fact that at one point in time, you're working with the governor's office of economic development and other entities to go after or to attract larger entities. So the question I would have for you is wh whether it's a, a go-ed or whether it's a state or a region, from an equity investment standpoint, what do you what do you look for in a company that you think will be attractive in terms of getting incentives or other forms of equity to come to the table? Yeah, that's a great question, Ken. Um, you know, I would I would say that I, I know that we we partner a lot with uh, with Startup Nevada, Startup NV. Uh, the Battleborn Venture Fund out of GoEd makes uh, investments, and really on the government side, it's it's about you know job creation, opportunity, uh, economic diversification, and specifically what they're looking for in the businesses: are they scalable? Do they have the ability to grow to to create good paying jobs? You know, do they have the? Are they going to at least on the the state and local government side? Are they going to stay in the valley? Um, and, and create an ROI for the residents here. Um, so, and, they, and then they look to, typically the government looks to, to hedge what they're doing. So they wanna make sure that, you know, the business may or may not have matching funds. I know that the Battleborn Venture Fund requires a matching proportion from the private sector. Um, and, then, and then like Startup NV has a lot of different platforms. They have, a plat they have platforms for um, companies that are just incubating. Really, there's an idea. Uh, they need to come into a program. They may need a little support. They may have some of their own capital invested as well as, like Chris mentioned, family and friends. Uh, then they may get to a point where um, they could take an angel investment, again, with the risk of not losing their company, uh, look at that debt to equity ratios, uh, then, you know, a, some type of pre-seed funding, seed funding, and then ultimately, you know, venture capitalists, series A, B, C. But again, um, the, on the government side, it's more about, you know, creating the jobs, enabling entrepreneurs, um, and, and finding growing companies to make strategic investments in that have the potential to bring a lot of benefit to, uh, to the state or, or the city. Perfect. And Ryan, I'm, I'm glad you covered that because one of the things we want to do here today is once again, give people a strategy or a pathway to identifying equity investors, but more importantly, figuring out what they're looking for so that you can access capital through those types of uh, avenues. Uh, you've talked about uh, some of the larger projects. What I now want to do is uh, go to Peter because uh, Peter, you mentioned that uh, you've been successful in terms of identifying companies, and I'm sure or I'm going to imagine several of them may have been startups or smaller companies. So let's touch on that a little bit. Uh, as an equity investor, what are you looking for in a smaller, perhaps even a startup company that you're thinking about investing equity in? Yeah, and, be, and Ken, if I may, uh, before I uh, jump right into that, I want to just tell folks, listen, um, it's not easy, okay? When I did my first project, development project, you know, I didn't have the money to do that project. So I had to go out and I had to, you know, think creatively and kick down doors until I finally found a person who believed enough into me where I was able to do that project with him. And as a, uh, I got creative as a, as a broker, I put in, I got equity by putting in my commission dollars to each sale of each building. And I let it ride. And that was, believe me, that was very risky at the time. And my wife, who uh, we needed some money, she wasn't exactly happy about it. But those are things you got to do sometimes to, to get over that, that little obstacle. Uh, as far as what I look for, listen, I had the, the, I was fortunate to be able to have a conversation with a guy named Michael Milken uh, at a very young age, just by, just by sheer chance luck my, my wife was an executive at the mandalay bay i got myself into this event that was going on and next thing i know i had a conversation with michael milky for those who don't know i'm not going to go into it look him up he's had some ups and downs but he is brilliant when it comes to investment and all this and he told me one thing that just really stuck with me and that is you invest in management 
You invest in the leader of the company. You invest in the person before you invest in the building and anything else. It's all about that person who's going to be running it, the management. And so that's what I look for when I, when I sit down and talk to people or, or think about an investment. I want to meet who's going to be running this thing, who's going to be leading this thing. And I want to hear from, I want to feel their passion. I want to hear, you know, how much knowledge they have and what they're about to, to go down. I mean, a lot of this stuff is not rocket science. What I'm saying here, it's really basic fundamentals, but a lot of people bypass this kind of stuff and they get it, they get enamored with maybe the, the product, which is important, but who's going to lead that product to market? Who is going to lead the company? Who's going to lead the troops? Uh, and that to me is so, so important. If I get a funny feeling and I don't really feel good about uh, you know, who might be the leader of this thing, you know, I, I may not, I may not go down that journey with them. Definitely understood. Uh, and that's a great point that you make that uh, management is key. Uh, and what I want to do now is just build on that fact a bit. Uh, once you've identified management and you're comfortable with management, uh, Chris, I want to come back to you in terms of Let's, let's turn the tables. Let's say I'm the company that wants to be invested in. I have a good product. I have a good service. I'm, I'm a pretty decent leader. What do I need to document or administratively? What kind of paperwork do I put together in order to initially get started? Yeah, so <clears throat> the, the first thing that I, when I meet with a founder uh, team that is looking to, to start raising money, um, you know, Ryan hit the nail on the head that the typical life cycle is, you know, the founders come in, they do a friends and family round, they go out, maybe they do convertible notes or uh, an instrument called a safe, which is simple agreement for future equity or, or, or a derivation thereof. Um, then they'll go out and they'll do, you know, a series seed financing round, which is a, a very simple preferred stock financing round. Um, then they'll go do a series A and, and on from there. For a founder group that first walks in my door, my first thing is I say, hey, listen, you guys got to have your agreement amongst yourselves first. And so we take care of the founder grants. And founder grants are very, very important because it sort of sets the starting line from where everybody starts from an equity ownership position. One of the critical things that I recommend to founders, and this isn't legal advice, um, so I throw that out there, but what I tell a lot of founders is, really think about making people vest into their equity. It is very, very common in a startup situation um, where founders come in the door, you know, a good founder team is usually around three to, three to four people. Um, if you're going it alone, it's gonna be a little harder. Investors are gonna say, well, what, hap what, what if something happens to you? Because then it's kind of over. And so having a team around you is, is critical. It's one of the number one criticisms when I represent a VC of a, of a startup is it's one person. So, you know, having a team around you, but the vesting, the equity, you know, typical vesting periods, it can be anywhere from two years to four years on up, but vesting of stock is critical because when you do those founder grants and say for, for ease, four founders, everybody owns 25%. A very typical scenario for a startup is that, you know, one, you know, one or more of the founders will become either disenfranchised with the idea, with their co-founders, or life comes along, right? Rents due, mortgages due, kids needs braces, you know, car breaks down. You got to go get a job that pays because most startups, you're not making money at first. Peter hit the nail on the head is every, your sweat, your blood, sweat, tears, money, everything is going into the business. You're not taking a paycheck home. There is no W-2. There's no health care. You know, you're kind of, you're walking around life going, you know what? I don't think I'm going to go on that roller coaster because I don't want to get, I don't want to get hurt yet, you know? And if, if a founder leaves and they take their equity with them, it can be devastating to that company. And so what vesting will do is it'll set a benchmark. A, tip, a very typical vesting structure is after a year, you vest 25%. And then after, and then, you know, you vest in equal 36 months installments for the next three years. And what that does is if a founder says, hey, you know what? We've been here for two months. We're doing this. It's not going the way I like. I'm out. You don't want that person to leave with 25% of your company because when you're going to go raise money from investors and they're like, well, you're, you want me to give you a million dollars for 10% of your business, but you let that person take them, take 25% of the company for free. You know, it's a real tough conversation to have. 
And if you don't have vesting, oftentimes savvy investors will impose the reverse vesting on you. And so they'll say, your, your shares aren't subject to vesting. They are now once I put my money in. Because if those people leave, it becomes what's called a zombie founder. And you have basically this glaring hole in your cap table where a person left with a huge chunk. And then, you know, part of that process is really make sure your cap table is ironclad. You want to know that that cap table is supported by documentations and writing. One of the biggest frustrations that I see founders, you know, that because a lot of startups don't make it right. And so startups don't need more help to not make it. There's already, you know, the winds are blowing 60 miles an hour in your face on a daily basis. And so you don't need to add anything to it. And adding to it can be, well, we didn't really have a written agreement. And then an investor comes along and says, here's a million dollars. And now all of a sudden everybody's saying, well, I own the company and you just work here. Or, well, I own 75% and you own 10, you know. And so you get really sideways real quick. And an investor is going to say, listen, I see 20 companies like you a day. I don't need a reason not to invest. You just gave me one. So I'm just going to go look at these 19 other companies. And so really sitting down with your founder team, giving up the company, documenting the equity, making sure there's a vesting term and going to an investor with an ironclad cap table and say, invest in us. And this is exactly what you'll own post your investment. Because if you have to call your investor and say, hey, we thought you own 10, you actually own 5% because we forgot this other person existed. That's not a good situation to be in. And it's, you know, I don't want to say easily avoidable because lawyers, all those resources cost money. But imagine if you're opening a franchise restaurant, fill in the blank, yogurt shop, hamburger stand, whatever it is, you're going to have to pay a construction company potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to get that location up and running. And so sitting down with your founder team and spending a couple thousand dollars on the appropriate documentation is the best investment that you'll make. Absolutely. In fact, I'll speak from a personal experience. Uh, I've been involved with a couple of uh, in business ventures, a couple of which I put a decent amount in. I was a small investor, not uh, six zeros or even five zeros, but uh, I had at least three or four zeros in there. So your point is valid. And again, uh, as we like to say here at the Urban Chamber, begin with the end in mind. And what I'd also like to do is, uh, to the extent they're uh, comfortable doing it, uh, if there are, each of our panelists could put an email and or phone contact in so that they can follow up. Uh, Chris in particular, I'm sure there may be individuals that are either startup or seeking to scale that may wanna follow up with you, but some great information. And again, what we wanted to do here with our Capital Connections, I'll come back to you, Peter. Again, what we want to do with our Capital Connections is plant some seeds with our small diverse businesses for the idea that it's not just grants, it's not even traditional or non-traditional lending, but there's also equity investment as an opportunity to attract or get capital. But to Chris's point, there's some things that you should do and invest in before you get too far down the road. Peter, I think you wanted to add some things to this discussion. Yeah, I wanted to try to simplify uh, uh, something that uh, for folks out there, I, I really recommend this and I tell a lot of young people this, if you can get your hands on some old Shark Tank shows, I prefer the old, older ones because it was less staged and less, um, you know, about ratings and, you know, um, I'm not going to say it's staged, but uh, it was the older versions of Shark Tank were really real and raw. And they're great for people to watch on what to do and what not to do and how to be prepared and, and, and what, what is not prepared. Uh, those early on shows were brilliant and I watch them. I still watch them all the time uh, to get pointers. And uh, I, I rec highly recommend that to people. Very much agree. Uh, because the one thing about business is it's not personal. I mean, the idea of product or service may be personal to you, but at the end of the day, a lot of times it's about the numbers, the way you've structured the numbers, documented the numbers, and then presented the numbers. So we, we just want to keep that in mind, and we want to make sure that our members and beyond uh, do what's necessary to best present themselves. And, and to that end, 
Uh, Ryan, you talked about the fact that from a jurisdiction or a major public agency, what is attractive is the fact that they may be creating jobs or they may be bringing in economic development activity. Uh, but I want to ask you the, the same question. Uh, if a company, uh, whether they're already in Nevada or thinking about relocating to Nevada, what are some of the things they need to do to present themselves or prepare to present themselves to a potential jurisdiction, state agency, or body like GoEd? Yeah, so I always try to I always try to put my uh, myself in the shoes of you know the person mainly trying to start a new venture and you know where do they go how do they how do they find these resources you know everybody a lot of people know about the SBA and and small business loans and some people know about the small business development center but then on the on the equity side I feel like it's a lot harder to figure out who to go to. Like, do you just pick up the phone and call Chris because maybe he knows some people, you know? How, how do you actually network? How do you find that? Um, and then once you do find it, what do you need to be prepared with? And Peter made a good point of like, hey, go watch these shark tanks because they are gonna drill these individuals with questions. And it's no different than uh, in government or non-government or quasi-governmental bodies i mean they're all, they're all looking for the same thing do you have a do you have a founder that has passion that you believe in do you have someone that has their ducks in a row in terms of you know what are they pitching is is it what type of product or service uh, but then at least in what we do to help uh, founders like we'll give through startup and v or others like direct feedback like we review pitches like companies will submit pitches. We, we look at them with a group of other uh, kind of experienced founders and they'll say like, hey, you need to do X, Y, and Z to make your pitch better. You need to present this materials different. You need to refine how you go through your PowerPoint presentation, like immediate feedback. Um, and then there's different programs. So like once, once they're, you know, they have a solid business plan, they have a really good product or service. It's a founder that's passionate about it. Um, and they get ex like accepted into one of the programs. Okay, then it's starting to say, how are you gonna commercialize? How are you gonna set up? You know, what are your potential revenue opportunities? But um, same way as anybody else, I just, I felt like coming to the city and it may just because I, I didn't come from the world, like I'm not, like I didn't start my own company. Um, I just thought it was complicated very complicated to, to have an idea and then eventually, you know, X years down the road have, you know, a successful business, whether that means it's a restaurant or whether that means it's a tech company with 5,000 employees, like it's just complicated. And so, and I, in, in, and again, in, in Las Vegas and Nevada specifically, and Jeff will even tell you this from startup and V like he, I think 44 companies have gone through his platform and they've raised about $80 million, 1% has come from Nevada, Nevada investors. Um, so, you know, he, he, Ken, you were at the angel conference that he did where it's like, hey, we wanna get community members engaged, but it's definitely hard to find them. And that's what at least we try to help with of, of finding the avenues to get people in Nevada, specifically Southern Nevada, city of Las Vegas, opportunities to catalyze their business. Yep. And I want to hop in now and make sure that we publicize this resource. Uh, Jeff Sailing uh, is a founder, executive director for Startup Envy, and we want people to take advantage of that. Uh, we'll be periodically putting that link in the chat. Uh, I want to say thank you to Delisa Stewart. She's our operations and programs manager and also monitoring the chat. Plus we'll try to type that link into Facebook Live, but Startup Envy is a great resource. Uh, recently, I sat in on their latest cohort uh, leading into the Angel Investor Conference that uh, Ryan just mentioned. Uh, but if you have questions about how to get started, how to put your presentation together, the good thing about Startup Envy is they're attacking it from both ways and Chris referred to this as well. Uh, on the one hand, they're trying to provide education to founders, business owners, entrepreneurs, 
that are looking for capital, but then at the same time, to Ryan's point, we have a dearth of existing venture capital, uh, equity investors and angel investors in Nevada. Not that they aren't out there, but in terms of it being a little bit more formal, we're still working on that. Well, Startup Envy is attempting to one, pull that group together and two, provide education where ne necessary. Because in many cases, we may have high net worth individuals, but they're either not comfortable or educated enough about how to approach it, which is the reason why I wanna go back to Chris and say, from your perspective, what are some of the resources that a founder or an entrepreneur or a business owner that's looking for capital, and let's say they may wanna access some of the individuals that you're aware of, are there resources out there or networks Steve? out there that they could use to try to one, get their presentation together and then two, access those individuals? Yeah, and so, you know, it, it, raising equity in Las Vegas outside of real estate is, is a challenge uh, for, for a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, you know, Nevada historically is, is very pro um, real estate, very pro gaming. Um, and those are, those are tangible assets that investors can, you know, go fee, you know, see, feel and touch. Um, and, and they just, you know, historically that's just where Nevada is at. So the, the transition of our economy um, and the increasing kind of, you know, diversification of our economy is a very exciting, I think very important thing uh, for the future of the state of Nevada. Um, and you know, one of the most important things in that process is gonna be founders feeling like they can come here and raise money from their community. There's a reason why tons of venture capitalists and tons of startups are in Palo Alto, right? You can go have coffee and pitch your company to someone and that person says no, but the person sitting behind you says, I'll give you the money. You know, that's, that's a little, yeah. that's being a little facetious, but you know, it's, it's very much a community that is, Hey, we're all coming here for one reason. And that's to get stinking rich doing tech companies and highly scalable businesses. Right. Which is why, you know, a parking spot is, you know, 500 grand or whatever it is there, which is why I love, which is why I love Nevada. Uh, um, but I, I think, you know, looking around at the community, it's really incumbent upon us um, to really try and see what's there, foster that and encourage, you know, additional um, capital investors coming on board. Startup NV, Fund NV, Jeff Salling is really trying to pick up that torch down here in Southern Nevada. Um, Reno Seed Fund up in Northern Nevada, a gentleman named Gene Wong um, is really pushing hard. You have organizations um, in, in Reno, um, Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada, uh, EDON. Um, down here, you have um, LVGEA, Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance. Um, you know, there's organizations out there that are sort of places that when a person comes to town, they're like, well, where do I go to kind of learn some stuff? Those are good resources. There's also angel investor groups. And angel investor groups, they, they go up in, in use. You, you, you know, one year, you may have a bunch of angels that are very active. Other years, they, they may not be as active because the members are just, you know, life comes up. But you have here in Las Vegas, you have Las Vegas Valley Angels. Um, they're not as active as they used to be, but that's just because a lot of the folks that are in there are getting a little bit older and are not really looking to be invested in privately held startups that may take five to 10 years to, to actualize or, or provide a return. And they don't want to be in a position where they're pushing founders to, hey, you got to sell because... I got to, you know, start doing my estate planning and I'm not going to be around. And so, so they just don't want to get in that position of founder. So locally, you have some of those resources, but nationally, you know, I, I'm a securities lawyer. I'm a securities nerd. I used to be a securities regulator. And so I get very passionate about regulations and things out there that sort of govern this arena. And under President Obama, one of the most transformative capital raising laws came into effect, and that's the Jobs Act. Jumpstarter Businesses Startup Act. It's one of the most important pieces of legislation for entrepreneurs in the history of, you know, since time began to, to now. And what it does is it really increases the regulatory avenues to raise money and allows people on a local level to raise money nationally and in, in, a, in a completely legal and compliant way. And so I tell folks, 
hey, listen, if you don't want equity investors and you're saying, well, I don't want to personally guarantee a loan to the SBA because I don't want this isn't I'm not putting my kids college fund on the line, not put my house on the line. You know, our spouses, our partners, they're very supportive, but you got to be protective of your family, too. Right. Um, that's why it's a lot of people say entrepreneurship is for the young because you can you sign a personal guarantee and you don't care. You're like, you can come have my student loan debt. You know, it's, it's yours. Um, but for folks that are looking to raise to seriously raise money, you know, there's ways you can go to Kickstarter, for example, and you're not giving up equity. You're just pre-selling your product. And Kickstarter has been a catalyst for companies that are just phenomenal now. Yeti Coolers is a, re is a really good example. They did, I believe, someone has to fact check me here. I'm, I'm pretty sure they did their, their initial raise on, on, on Kickstarter. They and did. they're now one of the most successful cooler companies on the planet. You know, I know people that are like, my, my goal is to own a Yeti Cooler. You know, I, I'm one of them. I, I, I you know, got the Igloo still, it, it works. But the Yeti Cooler is transformative. Um, and they, I believe they did it through Kickstarter. Um, there's also equity crowdfunding platforms out there. A really popular one is CircleUp. Um, and CircleUp, you know, you basically post your offering on there. It gets vetted by the community. And so a person, you might, your equity investors might be in Missouri, New York, Florida, you know, Alaska, wherever, and you're raising money from here in Las Vegas. Those platforms have certain hurdles that you have to jump, certain requirements that you have to meet. But this is all things pre-Jobs Act were difficult, if not impossible, to do. And because of that legislation, um, founders can now do that. And it was really focused on leveling the playing field so that entrepreneurs could raise money and scale their business. Um, they are complicated tools to figure out. Automation is, is critical. Um, and it's, you know, if you, if you, can figure, you can try and navigate it yourself. But having a, a person that's either used it before or having an attorney that can help you walk through it is critical because once it's out there and you start taking in money, there's really not do-overs, right? There's no like, well, I'm going to give you the, I'll give you the money back. I'll do it the right way next time. So it's, you know, those tools are out there, but I think Nevada, I think anything we can do to encourage more groups like that to come to Nevada, the better. Um, a lot of our historic, you know, the Las Vegas Valley Angels, and folks that you know really went out of their way to invest in our community um, are, are getting up there in, in years. Um, I recently learned of the passing of a gentleman named Thomas Gallagher. He's a phenomenal yep. man, yep. Uh, a catalyst to, to the Nevada community. I had the benefit to work with him um, uh, for a very short period of time. And I can tell you, people like Tom are what it's going to take to you know, level up Nevada to that next phase, you know, my heart and I, you know, I'm tearing up talking about it, but my heart goes out to his family. But a lot of the folks that are of that vintage are starting to, to, to pass or to, to kind of retire. And so it's time for the next generation. I think Jeff is picking up a torch and he's running. And I think anything we can do to help foster those folks is, is going to be critical to making sure that our kids and our kids' kids can call Nevada home. And, and I want to use that as a segue. I mean, that's perfect, Chris, for me to make two points. Uh, the first point is that at the Urban Chamber of Commerce, we are definitely partnered with uh, Jeff Sailing and Startup uh, Nevada or Startup Envy is, is the entity. Uh, it's been an ongoing partnership. In fact, we've had, uh, I want to say we had five to six of our uh, business owner entrepreneurs who also were interested in being equity investors be part of the cohort that just completed. So that's one. And then number two, uh, here at the Urban Chamber, we're making an effort to create our own equity investor group, because to your point, A, we want to make sure that we have the next generation. And then B, we want to make sure that there are equity investors out there that are professionally and culturally competent uh, to our membership. Uh, moving forward. So I'm glad you made that point, Chris. Uh, definitely uh, high on our list in terms of priorities is making sure that we have the next generation to support our founders and business owners. Well, what I'm noticing is that uh, we need to wrap up here. Uh, I think we had one question, and I think you addressed this, Chris. So I'm, I'm going to ask this of you, and hopefully you'll say uh, yes, no pressure here on live uh, Facebook and everything. Uh, Chris, we would really appreciate it if maybe we could have a uh, webinar or something similar where you talk a little bit more about the Jobs Act and maybe a couple of, other, of the resources 
uh, that you mentioned. I think that would be real helpful to our audience. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anything I can do. I, I'm raising, um, you know, two daughters here, you know, born, born and raised in Nevada. And I, you know, I want them to be able to call Nevada home because I'm cheap and I don't want to have to go fly at holiday season to go visit them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you yeah. know, they got to have a place to go to work. Um, they got to have friends that are work. It, you know, it, it, it truly takes a, a village to, to sustain a community. And, you know, the more folks we can have informed and, and you know, oars in the water, I'm absolutely happy, honored for the invitation and, and would look forward to, to partnering with you, you and your group again. Okay, absolutely. So we, we definitely appreciate that. And yeah, Holland and Hart has been an ongoing uh, participant and partner uh, with this round table and other things of the chamber as well. Well, before we wrap up here, or as we're wrapping up here, what I always like to do is do a round robin uh, and just get a last 60 second of thoughts uh, in this case on equity investment. And I'm gonna go in the reverse order this time. So uh, what I'll start with is uh, Ryan, uh, 60 seconds closing thoughts to people out there uh, on the subject of equity investment or things we may have covered, or if there's one burning point that maybe you didn't cover, 60 seconds, here's your opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Again, thanks to you and your team for putting this on. You know, I, I honor to be here. Um, I think that uh, the points that everybody made are, are so valid. I, I will say, I feel like there's a lot of momentum um, in Southern Nevada in terms of getting more so uh, resources like Chris mentioned, um, you know, we have a, a aging group, but we have new ones coming in. Um, there are other stakeholders I know that want to be involved in this in Southern Nevada. And there's obviously a lot of money here. There's um, people like, like Seth Shore and Andrew Pascal and all these people that, you know, have built companies that are willing to help. And um, I just want to, you know, we're here to facilitate I've said I want to support almost anything that furthers the entrepreneurial uh, initiative. So I'm here to support and whatever government resources I can possibly provide. Um, there's groups that are meeting. We have a Tech Alley event the third Saturday of every month where just founders and, and, and people come meet and talk about these issues. And I think to Chris's point, like we need to create an environment where people feel like they can be successful starting a company here. And that means they need people to connect with and they need people that have gone through some of the growing pains they're going through. And where does that happen right now? Uh, we're kind of fragmented a little bit in, in right. Southern Nevada. So, so we're really working hard to, to create that ecosystem and uh, appreciate what all, all you guys are doing. And thank you so much again for having me. Thanks again, Ryan. Uh, Peter, uh, 60 second closing thoughts on equity investment. Yeah, I, you know, again, always like to try to simplify it um, and understand the demographic. Uh, you know, I think you really, really need to have your package tight. You need to know your product, your services, whatever your business is. You got to really know it, you know, completely and, and really be prepared to be passionate and selling it. You may only have one shot with some of these folks that are willing to write a check. And so you got to make the best of it. And and so that means you got to be able to build that confidence in that person uh, to have confidence in you, your business, but you first. So have that package really tight and, um, and be prepared that this is your one shot. Excellent. Uh, as we say at the chamber, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So right on point with that sound advice. Thanks again, Peter, for your Thank participation. You. Uh, last but not certainly not least, as well as we've already extended an invitation about the Jobs Act and related topics, but uh, Chris, if you will, 60 seconds, uh, parting comments on equity investment. Yeah, it, you know, and, and you know, I, I'd say I'll, I'll close with, with this. Mark Cuban started selling computers out of his house. You know, everybody looks at these, you know, Jeff Bezos started selling, you know, books out of a, out of a garage. People think that being a founder is for the rich. The opposite is true. The, the billionaires, the TV personalities you see, the reason people can identify with a lot of these folks is because they were just like them at one point in time. And it takes a community for that person to feel like they can thrive because lo life is hard enough, right? To quote Rocky Balboa, I'll save you the suspense. Life is tough. 
it'll beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. But it's not about, you know, how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And so I think we kind of have, you know, folks have to really look at what are my challenges and know if other folks can do it, you can too. I tell lost people that want to go to law school, they're like, I'm afraid of the bar exam. If I can pass the bar exam, anyone on the planet can pass the bar exam. If Mark Cuban can go from his house selling computers to a multi-billionaire and owner of an NBA franchise, you know, obviously that's a lot of success and some luck along the way, but we can all do it. The tools are there. We need to work as a community, bringing those tools together and, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships and will save me travel to a different state when my kids are older. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And on that note, I want to say uh, thanks again. I'm Ken Evans uh, with the Urban Chamber of Commerce, uh, Delisa Stewart's out there as well, my operations and programs manager. Uh, I want to say thank you again to Ryan, Peter, and Chris. Uh, it's been a very informative panel. Uh, we look forward to following up because uh, we want to get some success stories out of this. If I didn't say it before, uh, whether it's uh, grants for our for-profits and non-profits or whether it's equity investors for our for-profits, uh, ultimately we want to have some success stories. But to the point that many of you have made, uh, there may be some peaks, valleys, and challenges along the way. But what we attempt to do at the Urban Chamber through our Capital Connections programs is provide information like we have today, as well as access to panelists like we had here today to accompany you along the journey. Uh, with that, I'll mention that next week, same time, uh, we'll be doing our legal and marketing uh, panel uh, from 2 to 4 p.m., and with that, thank you all very much. Thanks again to our panelists, as well as those in the audience, uh, those on Facebook Live, and those joining us on the stream here. We appreciate your participation. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.